Thank you everyone today for joining us for the webinar, Food Sovereignty, part of the bi-weekly 2011 Art of Resilience Speaker Series. 2011? This, sorry, 2021. <laughs> See, you feel better, Caitlin? That made my great. first mistake. Yeah. <laughs> First five seconds, nice. Living, living, in the, living in the past. This series is a joint effort between the College of St. Scholastica and the University of Minnesota's Duluth Sustainability Offices to bring together campus and community to explore sustainability and equity in a rapidly changing world. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Erke, Sustainability Facilitator at the College of St. Scholastica. And I'm Jonna Corpy, and I serve as the Sustainability Coordinator for the University of Minnesota Duluth. And before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and we'll be able to share a link with you after the event is complete um, for your reference or to share with others that might find it useful. We also invite your comments and questions. So please put them in the chat as you think of them and Ryan and I will ask them of our guests during the Q&A session. Um, and as for format today, we're going to have our guests present for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll round out the last portion with question and answer. Um, and I want to start us off today. <clears throat> um, obviously, our title is Food Sovereignty. Our guests are going to be talking about uh, more specifically tribal food sovereignty. Um, but sovereignty is distinctly different from food security, which is a term folks might be more familiar with. And food security is framed as the right of all people to have enough food to avoid hunger and malnutrition. And at its most basic, it's a focus on ensuring people have enough calories to survive, to not be hungry. But food and food production is so much more complicated and complex than that. And from the ways that it is produced, the social relationships of producers to eaters and communities, and the cultural importance of particular foods and food ways. And then there's also the quality of the food, the way people are treated, that harvest and process the food. Something I learned the other day was that the U.S. is one of the only places that the people harvesting and processing the food are not called farmers, um, but farm workers. Um, in the rest of the world, people are just all farmers. Um, so if you don't harvest your own crop, what makes you more of a farmer than the person carefully picking each juicy strawberry from the vine? So that's something that really struck a chord with me in thinking about our food system. So what I'm getting at is that food security by itself does not encompass the complexity and importance of food, because um, it's not just about calories. I mean, not being hungry is very important, but we have a food system and food sovereignty is about taking an active part in that system as eaters, citizens, um, and larger communities. So that's why we're so excited to have Caitlin and Connor here today to talk about a local example of uh, food sovereignty, tribal food sovereignty, and what that can look like on the ground level. So Ryan, I'll hand it back to you to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Jana. The speakers for our session today come to us from the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Caitlin Walsh is a season extension, a season extension specialist for the band, and Connor Henneberry is serving as an AmeriCorps VISTA focusing on food sovereignty. Caitlin and Connor, we'll turn it over to you to get started. Welcome. All right, Buju, everyone. Hello. And I see some familiar names too, including some of our coworkers. So thanks everyone for being here. Um, yeah, we'll talk about tribal food sovereignty. We'll talk about some pretty big, pretty big topics very briefly, just kind of scratching the surface on um, tribal food sovereignty, food sovereignty, tribal sovereignty, <laughs> some, some of what those things mean. Um, but we'll be focusing a lot on agricult the agricultural side of that. Um, so this by no means is everything about um, all the things tribal food sovereignty, um, it's just kind of the beginning and what we're focused on, um, uh, me as staff and then uh, Connor as a volunteer. Um, so Anine, hello everyone again, and then I'll just hand it to Connor to start with some introductions here. Sure, um, Buju, uh, my name is Connor Henneberry. I am one of two food sovereignty vistas with the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Um, this is my second year serving with the band as a food sovereignty vista. 
Um, I primarily work on food related projects, but um, I've also um, helped with a, a variety of other things, including um, uh, community economic development strategy, um, and then um, uh, food sovereignty assessment. Uh, I've, I've learned a great deal um, over the last year and a half when it comes to food sovereignty. Um, my degree was not in food sovereignty. I actually graduated um, from the University of Iowa um, with a degree in political science. So um, the last year and a half has been quite the learning experience and I've enjoyed every second of it. Um, uh, I, I got my first um, experience with um, agriculture hands-on um, when the pandemic first happened, uh, and we didn't have as many volunteers able to, um, get out in the fields. So I helped manage a one fourth acre plot and, um, produce food for the band there. And, uh, that was a life changing experience. And, um, I pretty sure that I want to continue, um, doing food sovereignty work in the future. So, um, that's that's just a quick in introduction of myself, um, and I'll, I'll pass it on to Caitlin. Yeah, Buju and Dinaway Maganadok, Caitlin Walsh and Dijon Nakaz, Migazi and Dudem, Nagaju Anang and Dun Jaba. And and there I just introduced myself in the Ojibwe language or Anishinaabe Moen, um, how I was taught. And I just said, I'm Caitlin, I am Eagle Clan, um, and I am from uh, Fond du Lac. Um, I'm a descendant, uh, and I, uh, I'm lucky to be working for the band uh, with various food sovereignty projects, which we'll talk about today. Um, I come from a long line of food growers and gatherers. Um, and so some of this work um, is also just about preserving food ways and life ways uh, that uh, got disrupted kind of in my grandma's generation. Um, and so yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit throughout the presentation. So you might see, you know, my, my grandma's hands or some photos from just kind of the last growing season as um, I've been learning alongside her um, and we're both kind of reconnecting with uh, knowledge that was disrupted a couple of generations ago. So, um, okay. And yeah, I'll hand it to Connor to start pretty broad for us. All right. So um, food sovereignty um, has, has been around forever, but uh, the, the term food sovereignty was first defined um, or I guess uh, coined um, in 1996 by uh, the, the organization La Via Campesina um, to address um, global struggles over the control of food, land and water and has since been um, further defined through the declaration of Nalani um, during the first global forum on food sovereignty in 2007 or 2007. So in, in that, um, that declaration, um, food sovereignty was defined as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. It puts the aspirations of, and needs of those who produce and distribute or produce, distribute, and consume food at the heart of food systems and policies rather than the demands of markets and corporations. Um, a, a good way to kind of get this concept down or um, to understand the view or the pursuit of food sovereignty um, is through uh, the metaphor of uh, reinventing the wheel. Um, to reinvent the wheel is to duplicate a method that has been already um, previously created or optimized by others. And I, I wanna repeat again, food sovereignty has been around forever. Um, and the general principles are, are fundamental. Um, they've existed since time immemorial. The right to produce food um, through methods that destroy the earth um, um, seem basic. And uh, I guess when you, when you boil it down, um, uh, food sovereignty has just, again, been around forever. So um, what we're trying to do here in Fond du Lac isn't new. Um, uh, people have been doing it for generations. We are, are simply trying to reinvent re re the wheel. So um, I'll pass it on to you, Caitlin. 
Okay, um, so uh, how does Fond du Lac define food sovereignty? Um, so we, I mean, we can't really define that for every tribal citizen um, or even the community as a whole, but something that guides our work is the Food Sovereignty Initiative Strategic Plan. Um, and so you can see one way we define it is a condition where Fond du Lac community members are willing and able to ob obtain a safe, culturally acceptable, nutritionally adequate diet through a sustainable local food system that maximizes community self-reliance, cooperation, and resilience. Um, and I think a good illustration of that resilience is this photo here. This is uh, Nokomis, my grandma, um, planting some Bear Island mandamin or corn. So it's some corn that's been kept by Anishinaabeg for a long, long time and then um, got planted this last spring by my grandma, um, an Anishinaabe matriarch. And uh, yeah, it was a really meaningful moment for me because that's just, I don't, I don't know if that's something she's done for a long time. So being able to do that together has been really beautiful um, and to continue some of that, you know, intergenerational knowledge passing. So. Um, All right, so um, in order to uh, fully understand, understand or, or yeah, further understand um, food sovereignty, um, I, I think I should introduce um, the idea of tribal sovereignty. Um, tribal sovereignty is, is inherently tied to Fond du Lac's food sovereignty initiative. And uh, broadly speaking, tribal sovereignty refers to the right of American Indians and Alaska Natives to govern themselves within the border of the United States. Um, through this tribal sovereignty, the Fond du Lac Band engages or is able to engage in a range of activities, including um, citizenship, um, regulating on-reservation commercial activities, um, deploying varying levels of criminal jurisdiction, overseeing natural resources, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so food sovereignty leverages this idea of, of tribal sovereignty um, for the purposes of, of revitalizing the food system. And, and you can see that um, in, this, in this picture here. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Caitlin, but this is, is the ground breaking for um, the growing dome. Um, so yeah, we, we, um, we were able to um, utilize tribal sovereignty in order to get this grow dome built and hopefully, or we will be able to showcase this grow dome. Um, and, and future slides. Okay, and a little more about Fond du Lac um, or uh, Nagaji Wanang, which means where the water stops in Anishinaabe Moen. Um, we're one of six uh, Ojibwe bands that make up the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. Um, and we were established, uh, the reservation was established through the La Point Treaty of 1854. Um, so, you know, that was one way, again, where we asserted tribal sovereignty, which existed before any of these mechanisms, but that's just one way um, that we see that. Um, but it's important to note that um, our ancestors have been in the Great Lakes area uh, since 800 AD. Um, today, we have um, over uh, 4,200 citizens, or you'll hear, you'll hear folks say band members, too. Kind of depends on who you talk to. Um, and then there is a lot to say about the history of um, our foodways and how they um, were impacted um, by colonization and genocide. Um, one thing I wanted to note was just uh, when the reservation was first formed, it looked like that. You see the blue outline on the left. Um, that's uh, where the uh, reservation borders there. Uh, but they didn't include um, our rice, ricing lakes, our monoman lakes. Um, and so the tribe appealed uh, those borders and then the US government uh, redrew the lines to include the wild rice lakes. Uh, so that was just a pretty early and uh, strong assertion of tribal food sovereignty. Um, and then if you look at the other map, you'll see 1854, Seated territory marked off where Fond du Lac, the Fond du Lac Reservation is. And so if you hear us talking about treaty rights, hunting, gathering, it's that area. Um, and so 
uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of point that out so you know what area we're talking about. So, um, and yeah, to get more specific with our traditional foods, you mentioned binomen, wild rice. Um, again, to illustrate that, here's a picture of my grandma's mom um, winnowing, one of her winnow, ba winnow baskets, and then her husband must be parching the rice. Um, and Connor's going to go into more details about how we used to and do live with the seasons and how food uh, drove our way of life and drives our way of life. All right, so um, I'll, I'll just highlight um, traditional foods associated with um, their corresponding seasons um, in, in the picture. And in these two pictures, you can see um, uh, that I, I believe that's, that's maple sap being boiled down into um, either maple syrup or maple sugar. Um, and those, those are taking place, I, I believe, at sh just different sugar bushing locations. Um, so that is one of the primary staple um, foods of um, Zigwan or, or spring. Um, uh, the spring indicates the end of the long winter months um, and usually the beginning of the sugar pushing season. Um, and um, it also includes uh, the beginning of a new spearing fishing and gathering season in which uh, primarily sturgeon, walleye, uh, muskie and suckers are hunted and uh, spring barks and um, ephemerals like wild onions, morels, fiddleheads, uh, and wild ginger um, are picked um, for foods or medicine. Um, so can you switch to a slide, please? Thank you. All right, so um, the next season, uh, Nibbin or summer, um, marks the beginning of um, the summer hunting season, uh, the largest portion of the growing season, the most uh, prosperous gathering season, and uh, also the beginning of the wild rising season. Um, if, if you live in northern Minnesota, um, it's, uh, you can tell it's obviously the most busy part of the year. Um, people are able to get outside, and when, they're get, when they go outside, they're able to do a lot of things. Um, so uh, a few examples of native berries that are harvested during these this season are raspberries, thimbleberries, um, strawberries, blueberries, juneberries, um, and blackberries. And other native fruits include uh, pin cherries, choke cherries, uh, wild plum, wild crab, apple. Um, and most of these fruits can be dried for long-term storage uh, for the winter months. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, you can also, or summer is also um, the perfect time for, for um, collecting monomen um, or gathering monomen, which can also be dried and parched for long-term storage. All right, can you switch to, yeah, thank you. Um, fall um, or dog wagon um, is characterized um, by musky, walleye, um, what musky and walleye fishing and spearing, um, and then also deer and moose hunting primarily. Um, and the Fond du Lac Reservation uh, participates in an annual moose hunt um, where, where these traditions are um, optimized. So uh, I believe um, Fond du Lac is, is one of three or four bands in Minnesota that is able to um, participate in an annual moose hunt, so um, is an incredibly important activity um, to participate in, in the fall. Um, so, and also Dagwagan is, is the time to reap the benefits, the many benefits of um, the summer harvest or the fall harvest um, and uh, prepare for the winter months through um, uh, drying or canning. Um, and then um, additionally, traditional fruit, fruits, vegetables, roots, and nuts, um, um, can be collected during this period and stored. And then um, uh, baboon or winter um, increases the need for heavier foods such as venison, moose, um, and um, even uh, buffalo meat. And um, then additionally, um, wild rice, dried berries, um, resins, inner barks, evergreen, they can be collected and used for medicines um, or stored. Um, 
for uh, for later use. And we can move on and talk about the Food Sovereignty Initiative. All right, so in short, um, all um, the aforementioned activities um, are, are increasing um, and increasing the participation of all the aforementioned activities are a, a big part of the Food Sovereignty Initiative um, to supply, um, to improve the supply and resilience of local and traditional foods, to increase the knowledge and use of those foods and the activities associated with them. Uh, to increase cooperation between community members and the families and, and their families around these activities. And uh, just in general, um, as a consequence of that, to improve the health of um, everyone in the Fond du Lac Band. So um, in order to do that, the, the Fond du Lac Band formed um, the Food Sovereignty Initiative. Um, and let me just quickly read to you the vision statement of this initiative. Um, the Fond du Lac Band, the, the Fond du Lac Food Sovereignty Initiative, sorry, um, envisions a sovereign holistic food system rooted in Anishinaabe values that is environmentally responsible and empowers a thriving, resi resilient community. Um, their mission statement is to lead and coordinate um, the Fond du Lac community's efforts to rebuild the local food system in order to improve our community's health and, resi and resiliency with the intent of consistent and incremental strengthening of our tribal food sovereignty. And a good example of this tribal food sovereignty is, is this picture here. Um, these are, um, um, I believe it's it's minoman holes um, left over from the rising season, um, which we used over um, the, the summer months to, um, to provide nutrients to the soil and um, sort of as a replacement to, um, to mulch. Um, to allow water to, to seep in and um, uh, improve the um, production of, of the plants. Okay, and then yeah, something that I think we keep emphasizing is that, you know, this is work that's been going on for generations and um, even some of our programming that falls under the Food Sovereignty Initiative, you know, predates uh, FSI. Um, get a, the Get a Gun program or Garden program uh, that we have has been around for more than 25 years. Um, and it's, uh, it's a program where we have uh, 12 weeks of classes focused on all kinds of topics related to farming and gardening. Um, we have been having, what's our fourth? It's our fourth week of classes next week. And we're gonna have um, Jessica Green Deer of Dream of Wild Health talk about soil health next week. Uh, and then we also provide some hands-on learning and a demonstration plot uh, with a quarter acre out at Gitaganing, um, the place of the gardens um, or our farm, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then another huge event hosted through the Gitagan program is our uh, annual plant and seed giveaway. Um, last year, it was pretty amazing. You know, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic and we had, um, you know, more than 140 households come do a um, drive through plant and seed giveaway, um, just lying down on one of our roads. And so that gives plants and seeds for um, home gardens. Um, and then we also provide uh, tilling if folks want that for their home gardens. Um, and then in the before times, we'd also have a fall feast too. Um, and then shout out to Erica Legros, who's in this photo doing some seed starting. Uh, She's a huge part of everything we do with FSI. All right, uh, let's talk about Gitaganing. Um, so Gitaganing is um, a 36 acre farm that was purchased by Fond du Lac in 2017 um, as a part of a land buy buyback program. Um, it is, yeah, it was originally um, owned by um, non-band non members and was, and was purchased and then um, turned into um, this agricultural property. Um, it hosts three different food sovereignty programs, um, the Bimajitawin Gitagon program, the, um, uh, oh gosh, I can't see that yet. Um, it's, 
sorry. Uh, yeah, the BIM Agenda and Gitagon program, the Fond du Lac Gitagon program, and the producer training program. Um, it is also where I live. Um, <laughs> so if you if you look in the map and see uh, that little house icon, that is where I'm I'm currently at. Um, yeah. Um, so looking at this map quick, um, I, I can kind of briefly um, highlight some of the ongoings on the property. Um, yeah, Caitlin's your cursor. So where where Caitlin's cursor is right now, um, that is the kitchen cannery. Um, she will she'll touch on that um, a little bit more in the future, um, but um, I'm going to leave that to her. Um, to the left of that is um, our orchard. Um, and it is ever expanding. Currently, we have um, plum trees, um, apple trees, and um, cherry trees there, and it's it's fenced in so um, the deer don't get to them. And uh, that that fence was put in um, uh, late last year, so that was a big deal for us. Um, if we move down um, to the bottom right side, that is where um, the producer training low, or so yeah, bottom right side of the map. Um, that is where the producer training program is located. All those orange plots, uh, for the most part, are producer plots. So um, that's where um, everyone associated with the producer um, training program um, grows their produce. And they can use that for whatever they want. Um, they could sell it. They could donate it to the community. Um, it, is, it is theirs. Um, so the, the purpose of the producer training program is, is to mostly just provide a space for individuals who want to garden to, to produce food. Um, the, the green rectangle down there, that is the, the Gitagon demonstration plot. Um, Caitlin highlighted the, the Gitagon program earlier and, and this is um, their demonstration plot. We, everything that we, um, we give away and, and the seed giveaway or the plant giveaway, we, um, we produce there. Um, and um, over the last um, year or so, um, all the produce that we've produced, we've, we've donated to the uh, Fond du Lac Ojibwe School um, through a farm to school program. Um, another um, feature of, of this general area is um, the Grow Dome. Um, the Grow Dome was, was put in by, through an ANA grant um, and is, um, is we're, we're currently constructing raised beds there. Um, Caitlin will talk about that um, in, a, in a couple more slides, um, but that's a super, super exciting um, feature. Um, right, right above uh, the grow dome is um, a little wetlands area, and we are currently planning to um, put a native, native, um, like a, li a little native perennial garden over there to um, help prevent um, runoff into that wetlands area and then also help with um, erosion. Um, and then the large area above, um, or I guess in the, the northeast side um, of the map is, um, we, we, we don't have any set plans for it yet, um, but um, we have, we've thought about putting in um, additional um, production plots um, or um, maybe a space for grazing. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of space there, a lot of opportunities. Um, and then, uh, let's see, we also have a, a, an abundance of um, supporting infrastructure and mach machinery and they're, they're housed and um, let's see, we have, we have at least three pole buildings out here so um, yeah, we were really lucky to um, get this property with, with a ton of infrastructure already in place. And then um, in addition to that, um, another thing that, that came with the property um, was raspberry and blueberry patches, which we are um, hoping to clean up and expand further. Um, yeah, it's a lot of super exciting stuff going on out here. Um, and I'm not just saying that because it's my backyard. All right. Yeah, so get to gunning. And here's a photo of it from this past season. And it just got its name this past summer, too. Um, get to gunning, Place of the Gardens. And a lot of the activity there right now is through the Bamaji Duen Producer Training Program, uh, which 
uh, Erica runs through the Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. Um, so it's, that's been a really amazing partnership and just so cool to see the land get bought back and then to have Anishinaabeg growing on it. Um, we, so, you know, the, the program started with just several producers. Um, I think Erica might be on the call, so she could probably give us the exact numbers, but <laughs> it was just a couple handfuls of producers the first year. And then I think the program more than doubled in participants. And then this year it's around 36 was the last total I got. I'm sure Erica has an updated one. And so it's a mix of um, folks growing at home and um, us just uh, supporting them with supplies um, and uh, information. And then there's also folks out at uh, Gitaganing with acres with plots uh, ranging from I think 1 16th to a quarter acre. Um, <laughs> I'm very aware that, yeah, I think Erica's here and uh, I'm doing my best. Um, and yeah, so we have, you know, expert growers like Jeff Savage, who you see here, and then um, with his uh, granddaughter, um, Delilah, who also has her own um, salad business and uh, wild rice cupcake business. Um, so they really just I feel like they're there to be mentors to a lot of us. And then it just gives them a little more land to grow food on. Um, and then we also have beginner farmers who are just starting this year, don't know anything. And um, we'll be kind of just starting from uh, scratch with that um, and learning to grow their own food for their families. A lot of folks are doing that um, or they're maybe starting their own food business or their own farm. Um, it's really beautiful to be out there in the summer and just to see multiple generations um, out there growing food, weeding. Um, okay, and then another big part of my life is the uh, Miginogan, which is what we call the growing dome. Um, if you want to look up more about the specs with the dome, you can just look up growingspaces.com, I think it is. Um, that's who came and built the dome last fall um, using some grant funding. Um, and so this of course will allow us to extend the season quite a bit. And um, we were out there building raised beds a week or so ago and it got to be like seven degrees in there when it was like 30 something outside. It's amazing, <laughs> it's kind of magical. Um, and you know, one of the goals of it is of course to just increase the food that we're growing on the reservation and um, and then we're still working this out, but we're looking at supplying food for tribal programs like our Ojibwe school. We were able to do some of that with the Gitagon plot and in collaboration with uh, Bamaji doing Gitagon, um, donating food to the Ojibwe school and the elderly nutrition program. Um, and then we can also look at supplying food for tribal enterprises, you know, such as the casino or um, the uh, gas station. And we, yeah, we're still building infrastructure, but hopefully we'll get to planting seeds very soon here and get our first growing season in the dome going this year. All right, so two other programs um, affiliated with the Food Sovereignty Initiative are um, the Bimajitawin Gitagan program, which um, has been mentioned a, a few times here. And again, shout out to Erica Allegros. Um, and additionally, the Bamadizawin um, Gitagan Garden. Um, both of those programs are um, primarily headquartered um, behind the Ojibwe School um, and in close proximity to um, the tribal center um, so I'll, I'll start with briefly describing uh, what the Bimajitawin Gitagan Garden program is, um, is doing. So um, they were developed by the band in partnership with um, the Tribal and Community College, and uh, they operate as a research and demonstration garden. Um, and th in this garden space, organic foods and medicinal plants are produced through methods um, that preserve and promote traditional Anishinaabe cropping systems. So um, in, in this picture, you can, this is the, um, the garden. Um, you, can, you can kind of see this in action and, and Erica has done an incredible job um, in this space. Um, I, I would argue that is, it is probably um, the most um, uh, just pleasing, like <laughs> in terms of um, 
just general aesthetics, just the most pleasing spot on um, associated with the Food Sovereignty Initiative. Um, so if, if you get the opportunity, um, please check it out. It is, it is really beautiful. Um, the other program is um, the Bama Dizawin Gitigan program. Um, Kaylin, if you could switch over to the next slide. Sweet, thank you. Um, so this program is primarily uh, affiliated with the Ojibwe School um, and it allows students to operate a market in the summer and then uh, which, which sells fresh produce and, and value added products and it also doubles as uh, a, a great educational resource. Um, so an example of that educational resource is, is to the right. Um, that picture is um, the, um, the, the cook shack or, or the sugar shack. Um, which is, is located right behind um, this, this garden space. And um, earlier this year, we, we landed a grant to renovate um, the, this building, um, to enclose it, to protect it from the elements during, um, during the colder months, and then to build a, a functioning oven inside. Um, and so hopefully um, this space can um, function to, to teach students um, how, to, um, how to utilize uh, traditional um, um, or how to, how to utilize traditional foods and, and learn how to cook, um, not only during the summer, but um, year round. Okay, um, so another project that kind of came on fast and furious uh, with uh, the pandemic, um, because, you know, one thing that we saw, you know, it was, it was a definitely, a, it was a hard time um, for our community. Um, and we really saw, I don't know if you remember on this time last year, you know, how fragile our food system is and um, how it can be kind of scary to be super reliant on uh, food from outside of our communities. And so we did see that, um, but one of the good things we did see was uh, more investment in food sovereignty, um, knowing how critical those things are. So we were, uh, through some COVID relief funds, we were able to build uh, Na Enimo Nigmig, which is what we call the cannery, or it's a community kitchen. So um, this space went up super quick um, and it has, um, all sorts of equipment for folks to use to process maple syrup, to um, host meals, to do classes, um, bake candies, dehydrate produce, can. Um, so it's one of those things where these are things that are already happening in the community. We have a lot of local businesses, band, band member owned businesses or businesses owned by descendants. And um, this can just kind of uh, stretch people's capacity and give people a, a food safe space to um, expand their business or do their business or just preserve food for um, their families, not just, but to preserve food for their families. Um, yeah, and I did want to mention, uh, we didn't express uh, explicitly, but a big part of food sovereignty is also seed sovereignty. So something that should have been mentioned maybe in the fall time is that along with gathering and um, preserving produce, we're also um, saving seeds. And for me, I'm just learning about um, seed keeping, um, seed saving, and seed rematriation, but that's a really important part of food sovereignty. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention it. Um, and hopefully I can talk about it more in the coming years when I learn more. All right, so um, this is all future stuff. Um, so this is all pending tribal council approval and then um, further direction from the community. Um, but um, Caitlin was talking about earlier how um, we were looking to supply tribal programs such as the Ojibwe School, elderly nutrition programs and, and tribal enterprises with, with food produced um, in Gitaganian, um, in the growing dome and, and so forth. So um, the, the agricultural division is, is um, a medium for that. Um, it, is, um, it, 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 it works to um, put all of these different programs 
including the Bimbo um, Jitawin producer training program, the Gitaganin production farm, um, the Gitaganin growing dome and so forth under, under a single umbrella and um, to produce food for the community. So again, all theoretical, um, but what this would look like um, be some sort of um, distribution network that um, enables all of these uh, producing entities to channel their production um, through some sort of, or channel it through the kitchen cannery um, and, and the food cellar there through um, a, a food hub or something of the sort and um, distribute it into the community. Um, and to get um, the Ojibwe school um, food produced on the reservation, to, to fill local natural foods grocers with um, tribally, tribally produced um, produce um, and to um, keep, keep the money um, um, in, or I guess keep the money flowing um, from um, these entities in, in the local community. Yeah, so again, none of this is set in stone and could definitely be, um, will be influenced by tribal council, by the Fond du Lac comprehensive plan for the band as a whole, um, community input, staff input, but it just gives you a kind of a peek into what the future could look like, essentially. Um, and then, yeah, in preparation for this um, series, too, I know we were going to kind of sit on this question about, you know, what attendees can do to support tribal food sovereignty. What can we do um, to take back some of that control? And I know, I think Connor's still thinking about this question, which is totally fine. Um, but I, and I know I kind of struggle with it, but with like the simple things folks can do, of course, is supporting native producers and um, organizations. Um, that's pretty simple. Um, if you're in the Duluth area, there's a lot of opportunities to support tribal producers. Um, and we're gonna have what, the Nguyen Indigenous Market to, to be supporting, um, everything ICO's doing. Uh, and then we have some producers this year, even in our producer program, who will be selling at farmer's market and things like that. So just watch for that. Um, another simple thing you can do is follow us on, um, Facebook and Instagram. So if there's any major developments with the farm, if we decide to, you know, start a pr production farm or something like that, you'll see some of those updates there. Um, so there's the um, at FDL get a gun. Um, yeah, and then more largely, I mean, I know we've all been, you know, really digging deep this year. And I know one of my tasks of even Connor's cohort of VISTA members was just trying to think about, you know, and find the, the real history of the land that you're on. And if anything, that's my one ask. Otherwise, it's hard for me to tell you what to do because I think it really depends on who you are, what your own story is, where your family comes from, what privileges you might hold, um, what you should be learning, what you should be thinking about giving away that sort of thing. Um, and the other big thing that's on my mind a lot, I, especially being in agriculture, is that we know, you know, millions of acres are going to change hands in our generation. And most of that land, farmland right now, is owned by white people. So it's a huge opportunity, I think, for us to be working together to make sure that land stays local and stays in the hands of small farmers. Um, while also returning it to indigenous land stewardship. Because um, yeah, one of the big threats to our food system is bigger developers or like Bill Gates buying up this farmland that should be staying um, in our local food systems. So it's just a, I see it as a huge opportunity um, because we know, you know, 100% of native land, whether you're in 1854 ceded territory Minnesota or on Turtle Island anywhere it's all native land so we can kind of operate from that reality and just figure out how we're gonna retain control of our local food system through land so that's what I think about but I'd love to hear what people want to learn more about if you have questions um yeah miigwech thank you all so much for listening um I know Connor and I are still I think 
finding our voice in all this. So we really appreciate your patience with internet connection and just finding the right words and are so grateful that you took some time today to learn more. Oh, you edge. Thank you. With this, there's so much in there, you two. Um, and we've got the first really great question um, that has come through. I am going to ask Roomby to ask it live because I want to make sure that it is, it gets to what she is trying to get to. So Rumi, um, please ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much uh, to our great presenters for the great work. It's very encouraging and exciting. My question is, there is a huge drive and understanding and knowledge gathering that is gaining acceptance and pressuring towards regenerative agriculture um, instead of the monocultures of soya bean and corn we are finally talking about nutrition density per acre and this has been a specialty for the indigenous nations. So my question is, how pleased are you to leverage and take leadership on the same? I recently attended the Sustainable Farming Association Midwest Soil Health Summit. And I also am aware of the Minnesota Climate Adaptation partnerships and their climate solutions uh, for continuous living cover in agriculture. They are also called evergreen. I, my concern is for the indigenous nations to be overtaken, yet this knowledge is indigenous to them. So how pleased are you to leverage and take leadership in this new dispensation that is challenging conventional monocultures. And now players are coming in towards nutrient density, agriculture that has been your backbone all along. Thanks for me. Yes, miigwech, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and that's a great point. It is something that has been here. Um, and it's a really big topic, but I know what comes up for me is that, you know, going to whether, you know, going to conferences that are for farmers now who are primarily white what you see is a huge rush to learn about regenerative agriculture, but there isn't always an acknowledgement of it being indigenous knowledge, especially on Turtle Island. Um, so that's, I'm very excited that people are starting to think that way. And there's this erasure that's happening in that movement as well. So I think it is important to, for me, where I wanna have a strong voice in it, so that we, again, center in reality of food systems here that pre-contact, you know, we had a really strong relationship with the land. We had very strong food systems. Our environment was optimized for food and we had that good relationship and that was disrupted by colonization. And in Minnesota, we saw agriculture being used as a tool of colonization and genocide. And now with farming being white dominated, currently we're seeing more of a return to that because we know it's better for all of us. It's better for the farmer, it's better for the land. Um, and I just think it's important to center indigenous voices in it and not act like it's something that's now being rediscovered. Because um, to me, without holding on to that indigenous knowledge without centering indigenous people. Um, it's just like colonization 2.0, <laughs> sort of, or like, a, I don't know, 
green colonization. I don't know. I don't have a good fancy phrase for it, but idea being that, yeah, that's, that's indigenous knowledge we're talking about. So I think especially, you know, with who might be on the call, that's something that in ac academia you might run into um, where it's like, these are our life ways and no matter how you package it. So anything you wanted to add, Connor? I feel like I could keep rambling, but I don't want to. <laughs> uh, I don't, I personally don't have the cultural expertise to um, really speak to a lot of this. Um, I, I am. Um, I'm grateful for um, the broader um, Northeast Minnesota community for um, uh, mentoring um, us in a lot of ways and um, lifting up our programs um, and, and, and allowing us the opportunity to um, build up a food sovereignty initiative here um, and put us in the position to, um, to I guess, um, make this make this more of a mainstream um, effort to um, uh, lift up indigenous voices. Yeah, and I think another like big thing that usually comes to mind with any of these converse, kinds of conversations, it's local food systems are really great, but um, we need to also remember not just the local food system that they're now, but like who's missing, what's missing in the food system, what was erased to build this current system, what do we need to do to restore balance and build the food system underpinned by indigenous food sovereignty. Because again, if it's on native land, you can't have food sovereignty without indigenous food sovereignty. This has all been good. And um, we had an uh, attendee has been asking some questions specific about food access. And I know that you've talked a little bit about some of the programs that are addressing food access, but I'll, I'll kind of share the specific question. You can probably see them too. What is the food sovereignty um, initiative doing about the gaps between food access? I don't know if you can talk to any spe specific gaps. I saw Jason just added a few more um, questions on there that I'm not going to get into. I, I don't, I just had not able to read it all. Sorry, Jason, right as I'm talking here and stuff, but maybe um, if there's other stuff that you want to bring in about food access specifically with what you're doing, um, that could be helpful. Um, gaps in food access. I mean, for our work, the biggest thing has been just supporting people who want to grow and gather their own food, which a lot of us are doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're able to address some of those gaps by giving people, or, you know, we're not, I don't I keep saying weird. I don't even like access or saying giving because it's just, it is tribal land and we just kind of support what people are already doing. Um, but I know for me, you know, one way we could look at that is we, we have like the elderly nutrition program, which fills some gaps that you would see. Um, and, or like if uh, we know elders who can't grow their own food, hopefully something like the growing dome, we could grow food and um, fill some of those. I don't know. Um, maybe I need more information about specifics on the question because yeah, no, I think that's good. Uh, Jason, thanks for your questions. And I feel like we have an opportunity to follow up with uh, Caitlin or Connor, you know, if you want, or ourselves at a later point. Um, I At this point, I want to make sure that we give enough time for you to any other like closing thoughts as you've put this information together and sharing out that you'd like people to access or to think about um, before we kind of wrap stuff up here today. Because I, I guess I see a question that was just posed um, regarding um, virtual Gitagon classes avail um, and whether or not they're available to the public. Um, I don't know if you saw that, Caitlin, but um, Caitlin is actually um, has a major role in scheduling those classes. So um, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. 
Yeah. Um, if you go to fdlres.com or just check out like our Facebook page, it'll have the details and they are open to the public. Anyone's welcome to come and learn. Yeah, I don't know if I have any parting words. I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> um, I'm just very grateful for this opportunity and grateful that we had a lot of people willing to just learn and um, the series has been very cool. So I just feel honored and grateful to have been invited to speak a little bit. Um, so thank you again. Amazing. Yeah, I, I just wanna, um... I guess closing words for me would be um, to, to attempt to answer uh, the question that was was asked at the end of our presentation. Um, what can you do to support tribal food sovereignty? And I, I think you probably um, figured from the things that um, Kayla and I have been saying that this is really there, there's a lot here. There's there's a lot of information to um, digest in order to um, fully or even partially grasp um, tribal food sovereignty or, or food sovereignty or regenerative agriculture or like how to, how to change these um, uh, systematic structures in order to, to better um, our local communities or, or indigenous individuals. Um, and I guess, um, so I, I, I try to educate, do, do as much as you can to um, educate yourself on these things because um, this is really the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, there, is, there is a lot there to, um, to do in order to, um, to realize um, uh, the goal and then the mission of food sovereignty. Um, and I don't know, I think a lot of people have interest in, um, in agriculture or growing food or um, uh, I don't know, it, it, it seems like <laughs> some sort of a wave you see like people like cottage core, you, you want people, people are, are wanting to move out into um, like rural areas and, and, and live on a farm and garden. And, and there's a lot to that. And um, there, there's a lot to um, agriculture. There's a lot to regenerative agriculture. And there's a lot of um, um, really complicated um, history, political or otherwise behind that. So um, if you're interested, um, take, the, uh, take the time and, and educate yourself and if, if you if you need resources to do that um please reach out um Kaylin and i are are probably more than willing to um to provide you with with an ample amount of information yeah and um again thank you so much for for having us i really appreciate it thank you very much for coming and sharing all the good work you're doing um just exciting for me i think to I always hear, you know, new stuff that's happening that's moving towards a direction that I feel is more just and sustainable. So thank you um, for your time today. Um, really, you know, thank you also people for attending today. If you have any additional questions or would like to connect with CSS, St. Scholastic or University of Minnesota Duluth Sustainability Offices, please reach out to us via the emails listed on your screen or on our social media channels. Yes, Caitlin, Connor, thank you so much. Um, I think the thing that I have gotten out of this chat and what you were able to share today is just so much hope and excitement, um, not just because it's springtime and we can actually start doing some of these things, but just the amount of things that are happening. Um, I feel like we could have done an entire session just talking about how you got your Food Sovereignty Initiative strategic plan organize and stuff um, and that would have been really interesting and something to hear more about as well um, so yeah really just appreciate you both and and so glad that um, you're doing the work you're doing to tell you really have passion for it so thank you for doing that um, and thanks everybody for joining us great yeah, right. thanks everyone <laughs> Take a walk, man. See you soon. Take a walk, man.